Hello and welcome to The Walk Podcast. Thank you for joining us. My name is Alex Brownsell and I'm the Head of Content for Walk Media. Unbelievably, we've already reached the halfway point of this year's festival and of our Creative Impact programme, which has been co-curated by Walk and Lions. There's been so many amazing speakers from Scott Galloway to Les Burnett, but there's so much more to come. The best place to keep abreast of all of the news and all of the insights is, of course, by listening to our daily podcast. But if not, head to walk.com and sign up for our newsletter as well. We have some fantastic guests joining us in the Walk studio today. Um, Unsurprisingly, AI has been a huge topic of debate at the festival this year. Um, So Yael Sazakas, uh, who is the Senior Vice President, Executive Strategy Director, Connected Communications at RGA, will be joining us to discuss and share her views. We'll also be speaking to Harjot Singh, who is Global Chief Strategy Officer at McCann World Group, on the status of purpose and sustainability here at the festival. But first, I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by Adi Kishore, Insights Director at Walk, who is the author of a brand new report on creating a culture of creative effectiveness that has just landed today. Hi, Adi. Welcome to the Walk podcast. How's your week going? It's been good. Uh, lots, of, lots of energy at the event and uh, lots of sunshine as well, which is always good. Absolutely. And, and, and you've been here to launch a, a brand new uh, report, a new white paper on creating a culture of creative effectiveness. Can you, can you let us into sort of where this all came about? Sure, absolutely. Um, so I think if you look at the last, I don't know, close to 10 years, really, we've had a succession of studies from reputable sources that have looked at the impact creativity or good quality, high quality creative has on advertising and advertising effectiveness. And in fact, more than that, on business growth and and actual business performance metrics. And yet, if you look at the deployment or the adoption of creativity or the belief systems around creativity, there's still a lot of question around the commercial impact of it. Uh, Relatively small percentages of marketers, in some cases, actually believe in it. Um, Very few believe that they can sell it into the C-suite and particularly the CFO. And this year, um, Lion's own sort of state of creativity survey found that um, there are significant cuts. 25% of marketers were actually planning to cut uh, their investment in creativity. So there's a pretty significant disconnect there. On one hand, we've had over a decade of research, uh, incredible research, proving that creative um, that creativity acts as a sort of turbo boost on advertising effectiveness. Um, and that has a very clear and very significant impact on uh, business outcomes. It's not just one component, it's actually a really major component. Uh, outside of brand size, it's probably the most significant factor in, in, in ad effectiveness. And yet, there's so many questions and so much doubt around why, you know, whether, whether creativity should be deployed or invested in by by brand organisations. This is something that I, I, it's easy to feel frustrated, I think, by this, given that the body of evidence, as you say, that, the, that, that there is and that exists, and, and yet there is still so much scepticism once you get into the high reaches of organisations. Absolutely. And I think, I think you know, over the years, we've, we've tried harder and harder as an industry to sell in creativity and talk more about creativity. And certainly at events like this, you know, um, the, you know, Can Lions is, is all about celebrating brilliant creativity. Um, and yet, you know, we've never sort of managed to get through. And I think that's what sort of inspired this study. So Walk, along with the Association of National Advertisers and Can Lions, came together last year because um, we're all we're all finding the same thing in our sort of interactions with the industry and said, OK, what's what's the blockage? Why is this thing not taking root? Why is it not moving forward? Um, and I think what we all concluded separately in both individually and together was that it was a culture issue. You know, the best ideas in the world, the most brilliant theory, the most deeply rooted in fact, will still struggle if uh, there isn't a sort of institutional belief in those things, in those concepts. You know, Peter Drucker years ago sort of said, um, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And uh, in some of our research, one of one of the folks that we talked to brought that up again. And I think that that really sort of sums it up, is that it's very difficult until you've established a culture of creative effectiveness within a brand. And so that's what we set out to do. 
Well, now, uh, a walk, there's, if there's one thing that we, we really truly love, it's a framework. And I believe that there is a new framework as part of this report that, that is going to empower marketers to, 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 to sell in the importance of creativity and, and how to do it better culturally in the organisation. Yeah, it's, as you say, we do love a framework. But I think in this, in this project particularly, um, we, we looked at this, you know, some, some, of the, some of the things that we're looking at are a little bit ambiguous, that are a little bit difficult to frame. I mean, what exactly is culture? What exactly, for that matter, is creativity? Um, and so we felt that rather than sort of rush into some kind of um, quant sort of structured approach or something that, that had very, very sort of uh, hard kind of benchmarks, it made more sense to kind of understand what the piece parts were first. And hence, you know, we, we, we sort of, we wanted to, we wanted to look at what are the, what is the structure around building a culture of creative effectiveness? What are the key elements that become a part of that? And then how do we sort of implement that within an organization? I think I believe this has been quite a sort of long term project that's been going on for quite a long time and, and you've obviously been able to really get into the weeds of the subject. Where are the sort of big pain points, the big challenges that you've identified? So, you know, I, th I think our framework probably sums that up best. And it's, uh, you know, we call it the ABE framework, the Align, Build and Embed framework. And those are kind of the three key kind of pain points where we see an organization struggle. The Align element is, uh, you know, really getting buy-in from the CEO and senior management, getting the board to believe in creativity. The build component is actually creating the systems and the processes to make that happen because it won't happen on its own. Um, and then the embed part is probably the hardest for an organization, which is really pushing those beliefs, inculcating them into the root and branch of the organization so that everybody from the broadest sort of regions, from the smallest brands within, within Umbrella, all buy into that and are working to the same system. So there's that, that's, that's why we call it the ABE framework, the Align, Build, Embed framework. And then we have you know, building blocks at a lower level that we can go into. Absolutely. And, and yeah, acronyms, a close second to frameworks in the, uh, the walk hierarchy of good things. Um, are, are you seeing different um, approaches across the industry, across different brands and categories uh, to this challenge? That's a really good point. And yes, absolutely. Um, it's quite interesting because the journey towards building a culture of creative effectiveness it is quite sort of inconsistent. It starts in various different places. So in some some cases, you may have a CEO who is really believes in creativity and is actually an advocate. And that's where it sort of takes off and gets pushed into the organization right from the top. So there's no need to convince them. There's no need to align with their thinking. They're the ones actually making it happen. Conversely, in some cases, it's a CMO that you know go, really believes in it, does the spade work, finds the evidence, you know, and is able to pitch and prove the the value of creativity um, to the C-suite. In some cases, though, you know, it can happen serendipitously. In, you know, one example, there was a brand that just ran a particular campaign. And for a combination of reasons, that was a, that was a very creative, very differentiated campaign, and it had huge results for them. So suddenly the CEO is looking at the outsized kind of um, ROI on this and going, well, what happened here? Like, how did this happen? And then, of course, how can we replicate that success? So that's where the systematic kind of approach to building that culture began. Yeah, and, and a bit of envy as well, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, when an organization sees that the, 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 one of their rivals or competitors is really, you know, achieving greater goals, then, then hopefully that'll, it'll catch on. Um, in terms of the report, I believe it launched this morning here in Cannes uh, with a session on stage. So, so you know, where can where can people go to read it, and and, and what comes next? So, uh, the the report was launched this morning. We we had a session um, at the um, the terrace stage at Cannes, and, and we, we we launched it, and I went through the framework. Um, the report is available on walk.com and certainly subscribers have access to it. There's also a sample report that can be downloaded by uh, non subscribers. Uh, it's not obviously as in depth, but it provides quite a lot of insight into into how we went about this and the framework itself. That's sort of phase one. Uh, I think the goal now is to try and build a quant piece around this, and that'll be kind of phase two for us. Uh, three partners, Walk, A and A, and Lions will get together and and uh, start working on on that piece moving forward. Well, it's a project well worth following and it's well worth reading. So please, I do urge everyone to, to, to go on to walk.com and to ch check it out. But thank you, Adi, for finding some time to talk us through it. Pleasure. Thank you, Alex. Very, very happy to say that I'm joined by the the wonderful Yael Sazakas, uh, who has come from RGA, uh, has come over all the way from San Francisco. 
That's correct. And um, has joined us in the Walk podcast. Now, you've been um, uh, somebody that we've worked with over a long period of time at Walk. I think, believe you spoke on the stage for us last year. That's right. And this year, um, as you have gone, I'm sure, around the Croisette and to different events, you probably can't really avoid AI. It feels like it's the absolute <laughs> buzz topic this year. How are you finding the event so far? Um, first of all, the, the festival has great energy this year. Um, last year was kind of coming back. This year, it feels like the conversations are uh, very energetic, upbeat, uh, thoughtful. The buzzword is definitely AI, more particularly generative AI. Yes. Um, and I have to say, last year, the buzzword was metaverse. And I was so irked by that. Well, yeah, we all know what happened <laughs> next, don't we? We do. Mm. Um, and that's why I'm very pleased that the talks, the the conversations between the talks are much more nuanced and thoughtful. And we have a way to go. Um, and we'll probably get into that in, in a few minutes. But but it's not the same uh, as last year's metaverse buzzy conversation. This is much more grounded. Um, so so we're we're heading in the right direction. Yeah, well, I think that's a really interesting point because I think with a lot of the metaverse hype last year, I mean, it, it, you know, I think there were certain organisations that obviously had vested interests in 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 absolutely hyping it, but it felt like it was it was intangible. I hadn't there was no real concrete examples that we we were able to look at. With AI, it feels different. You know, even in the last six months, there's been a huge amount of progress. There's been a lot of cool things that have hit the market, um, and some of those uh, vendors and purveyors are here in in Cannes this week. Um, so, d do you feel like it's it's a more credible buzz topic than the metaverse was last year a hundred percent uh but i i must admit it's also partly because i know i have the perspective that ai is is not a gimmick it's it has been used we just haven't been talking about it uh and now we're talking about it because the technology is is just uh being iterated and improved at a such rapid pace that we're able to do more and more with it. So now we're talking about it, um, but it's not a flash in a pan. It's here to stay. Uh, and so, and I think our industry learned from last year and um, and that's why we're hearing more nuanced, thoughtful voices around it. Yeah. Uh, what, what are some of the sort of interesting perspectives and points of views that you've heard so far this week? So, so it's interesting because heard this week in the festival, there is what is being done and how AI, generative AI is being used in the industry across agencies and brands. And then there's what is being talked about and in what forms, right? So so there's, and the, 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 the difference is quite interesting between what is being put on stage versus the conversations you're having off the stage. Because when we talk about, when, when you're having conversations with marketers, with agency leads around how they're applying AI models and tools and applications in their companies day to day, there are three key themes or categories. So there's the very unsexy ops and logistics and back office. Yeah. And no one talks about it on stage. And I, I get that, but that's essentially everything that is about running a brand, running an agency, um, talent, staffing, resourcing, and so on, right? Not sexy, but maybe one of the most important elements because that's how we become users of this thing and we learn about it and, and then we can apply it best, right? So that's the first category. I think it's the most important one. It's the least talked about one. Um, it's, it's supposed it's yeah. the least the one that we can't see, we can't touch, we can't experience in in the same way as an industry. So you know, exactly. it's, it's so much easier to talk about a cool piece of content. Exactly, and and I think I think that's that's problematic a little bit for for two reasons. Why one, if you are not familiar with the technology and its extent and limitations. Then, then the conversation veers off to 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 places that make it either 
threatening or gimmicky. And I've heard at least 15 times in the last 48 hours, AI is going to take our jobs, right? And it's being said as a joke, but there's an underlying like, oh, no. Yeah, there's an anxiety there, Right? Probably. There's an anxiety. And that anxiety comes from people not fully understanding what this thing is and what it can do. And using it as back office is the, is the first step to being a user that fully understands what this thing is, right? So that's one element of, of using it in back office. The other element that I, I care deeply about is this thing can improve employees' experience and their day-to-day -day, uh, work experience and lives, right? And that is, it can reduce anxiety. It can reduce busy work. It can um, it can make more time for, for, for other things, right? And so I do think it's, it's not sexy, but it's worth paying attention to. Um, so, so that's the kind of the first category, the ignored category. The second category of how AI is being used is the creative process. So mm -hmm. not the output. So this is research pre-brief. Um, uh, unfortunately, I did hear that some creatives and some strategists are asking ChatGPT to write the brief. Oh, gosh. Let's not do yeah. that. <laughs> but, it's, it's, you know, maybe it's an experiment. Um, even to write copy or even, uh, I think there's a, there's a company called Runway that uh, two months ago launched super easy to use mobile application where you uh, give it a text prompt and it generates a video for you, right? So, so there's a lot in the creative process that that AI, generative AI can be can be used for. And then the third category is actual creative output. So that's when that's what we're starting to see in award shows. Yeah, absolutely. That's when AI is kind of at the center of of what is being submitted or is the center of the of the creative concept. Yeah. It feels like, yeah, that the industry is getting very excited about the, the output side of things, that the creative that's coming through, and, and some of it's very fun and funky, but maybe like what you're saying is that they actually, you know, the brands, that marketers need to be aware of the inputs that are going to get companies and advertisers to the point where, where this output is successful and, and starts driving effectiveness. And, and that means investment, I guess. Uh, and, and that means actually, you know, th looking at your tech stack and, and working out what you need. And, and I believe that, that some research that RGA has been carrying out, you, you've heard that, that that level of investment maybe isn't where it, it needs to be. Two things uh, that, that I, before we get into, into the research. So, um, the first thing is that, yes, 100% of a lot of the excitement and the buzz and the submissions into award shows is focused on, on creative output. And at least in the U.S., uh, as of, I think, March, uh, the U.S. for um, uh, copyright uh, released AI guidelines that say that it all depends on the input you gave the model, the AI model. Yeah. And that is very, very crucial because some of the submissions we've been seeing this year uh, for award shows, the, the input itself was not created by a human that works at the agency or the brand. And so if an AI, if Dolly created uh, the painting based, based on... Uh, some other historic painting, I'm referencing a, a very uh, <laughs> famous case study that's, that's making the rounds in yes. award shows, right? Yes. Then where's the human? Mm -hmm. where, where's the human craft that deserves to be recognized, right? So uh, so, so that's uh, just uh, locking the, the AI conversation. Now, I wouldn't say there's not enough investment in, in the tech. I would say that it's about how we use the tech and, and what kind of tech we're investing in and, and uh, when, right? And so, yeah. um, and, and that's, that's the research uh, th that we've been, uh, that I've been referencing. So uh, shout outs to our iconic chief strategy officer, Tom Morton, that Absolutely. has been leading uh, this, this research and creating um, a point of view that will be released. He did agree that I'll share uh, uh, a little We're bit of it. very grateful, Tom. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so what we've been seeing is that um, 
in the last few years, there's a steady decline. Well, we, we all know that there's been a steady decline in in overall marketing budgets, right? That's that's by yeah. the way. Yeah. I don't know if you're hearing that, but there that's a, another topic. It is, no, absolutely. And this one, is this one we're following about. pretty closely as well. Exactly. Yeah. So along with that, the fastest declining category within the, the total pie of the marketing budget is MarTech investment by brands and agencies and MarTech utilization. That's so and, surprising because it seems such a hyped area and, and, and the potential for like, you know, really augmenting what you do as a, as a marketing team. So that, that surprises me. Yeah, it surprises, surprised us to, 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 to see that. Um, and it really started declining around 2018 and 2019, where you see it year over year continuing to decline. Um, and I can't remember the the percentages off the top of my head right now, but 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 it's it's now showing significance. Um, and so we have to ask ourselves, to your point, there are all these amazing tools out there that allow better the hypothesis that allow better and more effective, efficient digital marketing all around, right? We know how to find the people. We know how to know more about what they want, what they need, who they are, engage them better, service them better, and so on and so on, but it's not happening. So what we're seeing in another set of data is that there is a lag, a significant lag between the time of investment and the amount of investment and seeing or correlating the ROI to it. And in a recessionary environment, which we're in, this is very hard to justify, right? When I think, I believe the stat for the tenure, the average tenure of a CMO is what, two years? Yeah, a couple of years, I think. It, It seems to go up and down, but roughly around that point. This is hard to explain, right? Why would we, why are we investing in all these platforms if we're not seeing quickly enough yeah. the return on investment? So I think, I think when, when that POV gets published, it's, it's really a call to, to everyone. It's not just CMOs, it's agencies, it's, it's all the partners to, to really look into what are we doing uh, and how can we do it differently? Right, we're seeing the effectiveness across touch points going down. Engagement in uh, paid social content is going down. Mm-hmm. Um, more soft metrics around branded uh, paid marketing content. Consumers don't like it, uh, and um, yeah. So, so there's across the board decline in in how uh, how effective. Uh, these tools are and so why why is this happening and what can we do about it yeah it, it feels like a topic that that's ripe for digging into and, and we'd love to hear more about it as you and, and tom are ready to to spill all of the beans um in in the coming weeks thank you so much yeah. for for joining us on the walk podcast and and yeah i hope you enjoy the rest of the week here in can thank you you too alex appreciate it great being here Last but absolutely by no means least, the final guest on today's podcast is Harjit Singh, the Global Chief Strategy Officer for McCann World Group and a person that Walk is a huge fan of and we've worked with plenty over the years. Harjit, how has your week been so far? Really fun, really exciting. And it's just like, it's day three. So... I There's lots more to it's come. It's just so much more to come, and which is exciting and terrifying at the same time Absolutely. in equal measure. But it's just been an extremely stimulating week because I think it's been a really long time. In the last four years or five years, I'd say I've judged three times. So, And then one of those years was the year of the pandemic. Like I was here last year in this very room. We were judging. And I was just reflecting on this with someone earlier this morning and they asked me the same question. It's just, you know, it's like your muscle memory is just different when you're judging and when you're not, because when you're judging, you're here and then you spend like the bulk of your first week in Cannes in a room, talking about the work, engaging with the jury. You're just really, really focused and you just come in because you've looked at the work. You don't even look at the program. You're just, it's about looking at the cases and knowing how you want to have the discussion. And uh, then you have little moments of like release because you get out and then you come up for air and then you'll see your friends and, you know, run into people on the croisette and sound really, really busy and be like, oh, I'm just going to go this way. But (laughs) this time around, 
when you're not judging, it's just like going to a HIIT class, like a high level <laughs> training, because there's a lots of little little things and lots of short spurts of enthusiastic stimulation. So meeting people, going to sessions, and meeting clients, and meeting partners like Work, and meeting other partners at the uh, across Essential. So just I've had a really good time for the last. It three sounds years. like it's yeah. been busy. Yeah, um, and yeah. fun. I like busy. Well, no, well, they're definitely <laughs> in the right place. Then, what what have been some of the sort of key highlights? The things that you're doing this week. So far, I mean, what what we're doing tomorrow, for example, I've done a lot over the last two days, two and a half days. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, I've just walked out of this excellent session we had with L'Oreal on uh, stories of worth because there's just so much conversation on, you know, purpose, brand, Absolutely. commercial interests, social interests. It's just wonderful. The room was packed. And I just think that uh, that was very, very exciting and, uh, and and affirming because, you know, we just, I, we can talk more about this. Uh, I would, but, but I, I the would thing love is to like, more, you just yeah. realize, you know, I so believe that that kind of clear idea about what you stand for and why you exist and why what's good for society is good for people, is good for the, mar the business because, you know, I really believe that you can't move a market till you can move people up. Markets made up of people. People make up a society. So how can something that's good for the market be shit for people? Like so, you know. For me, that's just been so so important. But sessions like this just also go ahead and prove to you when you have a clear point of view on why you exist, it has the power to keep you current and enduring at once. Mm -hmm. That's like that's the magic of an amazing brand platform. So I'm just obviously just finished. Uh, you know, attending that, so I'm gushing about it. No, of course, but, but I, I would, uh, I would know. love to to hear your your view on on where as an industry we're, we're at with purpose, particularly uh, this year. It feels like we've, it's been a bit of a sort of roller coaster ride where there was a lot of work coming through that was very purpose oriented. Does it feel like the industry is is making progress around mm -hmm. this subject? I think we uh, well, that's, that exactly is my next session, if you will, where we're going to be discussing the importance of you know cohesion. And this being a part of the um, uh, the total brand strategy, it's mm. like uh, you know someone this morning at the IPG Equity breakfast, um, she said you know she was talking about uh, inclusion, and I think the same thing applies to purpose. Don't think of it as a social imperative. Uh, think of it as a growth strategy, and then you know it just totally changes the way you you know, think about it, yeah. that context is really important. So for me, the way I think about it, it's just, it's your immune system as a brand. And it just gives you the strength to kind of navigate uncertain times, difficult times, and also, you know, kind of strengthen it during good times by constantly earning your role in people's lives. Um, and w as an industry, we are getting better at it because the learning pool is growing um, yes. you know, bigger. It's becoming more inclusive and more expansive. And there are more examples on how what's good for society is good for business. So yes, we're making progress. And uh, the skeptics, I'm sure they're beginning to question their very strident views that I believe were quite <laughs> ill-informed. Um, but that's for another conversation, I'm sure. It is. We, we, we can yeah, talk about it at great progress. length. But that, no, that's really interesting to hear. And, and, and another topic that I know you're very passionate about feels like one of the key topics at this year's festival, and that's sustainability. Um, it has been for a while, but it feels like we're really tipping into it being, you know, you know a huge sort of um, dominating topic of, of debate up and down the Quasette. So... What's your view on 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 again the discourse uh, and that you've you've heard around the the festival so far this year on on sustainability? I just love that it continues to again become more expansive and um, you know just more uh, more interesting as as the years go by. So well, that is something we're doing at four o'clock today. Uh, we're hosting a session on SDG and uh, the creative and commercial imperative. And we've got lots of clients coming to that because, again, it's really an analysis of what the shortlists are, what they say about it, what's the what are the what are the themes that are emerging from there, and if you just look at just the sheer diversity of examples, the like brands across categories, it's not just political lobbies, institutions, and you know it's not just not for profits mm. in that space anymore. It's like real brands doing some 
real work in that direction. That's, again, kind of helping us all understand the importance of this from a commercial standpoint as well. Yeah. Like last year, I'm so proud of our Grand Prix. Like it was in this room we had the conversation about the Grand Prix. And if you remember, it was a real brand. People that you and I touch feel yes. recognize every day. We're talking about detergent. So, you know, it wasn't something that was ephemeral in that sense. And so I think sustainability is making its way into the hearts, minds and wallets, you know, in the, in the way we kind of like navigate those decisions mm. very clearly and very quickly. So that's a really good thing. The other thing we're learning around there is this understanding of causality versus mm. correlation. Is it, ex and that's such an important thing for effectiveness as well, isn't it? So the idea is, is what you're doing actually causative in the way it impacts your sustainability initiatives? Or is it just something that you do while that happens? Is it just an add-on? Is it just something that coexists, yep. correlates, or does it really cause? So I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. And the second thing I think that we are examining, interrogating, and learning that's becoming more and more important and apparent is this point on cohesion which is, is it cohesive to your brand's overall strategy and point of view? Does it feel like it is part of the whole brand's narrative and its point of view on the world? So if, it, if that's how sustainability is being baked in, and, and we know from Wall Street, this idea of the triple bottom line, which isn't really mm. an idea, it's a reality, it's people, planet, profit. So how the three are inextricably linked. So that's helping and the um, uh, understanding of sustainability as well. And that, and that feels like a change, I think, doesn't it, from previous years where um, I think maybe there were concerns when the economy wasn't doing so well and, you know, things haven't been brilliant lately, that brands would cut back on, on these sorts of um, projects, these sorts of initiatives. But it feels like it is much more baked in now. It is part of the sort of business as usual uh, and not just a sort of um, nice to have. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the same point. If you think of it as a growth strategy, it's essential. It's not optional. Mm -hmm. It's not something that you have to be like, oh, you know what, we're going to divert a percentage of our profits to, you know, just having some more sustainable, um, you know, uh, making more sustainable choices at one, two or three uh, junctures in the overall supply chain. It's not that world anymore. So, you know, because everything is, um, uh, is, 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 is up, um, you know, it's transparent. Absolutely. People can interrogate and, 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 and yeah. question it. And we know that it's all linked. So yes, sustainability is becoming part of the overall brand's narrative. That's really, really important. As, as a population, we're understanding that as well, that you know, if you want to move further, there are only, the, the resources are limited. Mm -hmm. So how do we continue to you know, enrich people's lives without depleting the world any further? And I think the other thing is we're also expanding our understanding of sustainability because the about five years ago, if you said sustainability, I even thought Palau Pledge. You know, it's mm. this idea of like, it's the planet. It's climate change. It's saving the oceans, the melting ice caps. Yep. But of course, that's a really important part of it. But I think Can Lines have done such an amazing thing by, you know, again, expanding the understanding around SDGs. And you realize mm. there's more than one imperative in the world and they're all sustainability imperatives because it is about affecting change in a way that continues to preserve the the, the, the this world so that we can continue to be um you know create more and um you know and have more uh, and yeah. share more yeah no it's a hugely in, important topic and um and one yeah. that needs creativity at its core Absolutely, which is yeah, which is right. It's, why it's great. It's so central to to what people are talking about here in in Can. And, and speaking of Can, what does the rest of the week hold for you? Like I said, we've got the sustainability session this afternoon. Uh, tomorrow, we're hosting something on how the new reality of hybrid work impacts uh, what we do, because it's just so important that in this new reality, what are the conditions? for creativity to flourish in this new reality. It's a very exciting piece of research that um, you know we're, we're, we're sharing, unveiling, so to speak, uh, tomorrow. Sounds to, interesting, again, yeah. Really We'd love to hear audience, more. I hope. Um, going, judging by the RSVPs, I think it's going to be a really good one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we, we're doing that tomorrow. And, you know, and then, of course, it's already Thursday, isn't it? 
Well, wow. the, the time is flying by, exactly. The days do just seem to sort of um, disappear while we're here. Um, thank you so much, Harjot, for joining us. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast. Thank you to Harjot and thank you to Yael and Adi as well. And thank you all for listening. We'll be back here tomorrow in our studio in the Palais um, with an exclusive debrief on a session looking at the triple opportunity of attention from Orlando Wood, Rob Britton and Karen Nelson-Field. Um, there'll be news from Walked Partnership with the B2B Institute, including um, an exclusive teaser of an interview that we've done with strategy luminary Roger Martin. And we'll also be joined by Yusuf Chuku, the EVP Client Strategy at NBC Universal, to discuss some new research into the role of context in media effectiveness. Make sure that you don't miss an episode of any of our Can specials or the regular Walk podcasts by subscribing on your favourite podcasting platform. And for those listening, you can watch all of our daily Can episodes on YouTube or on the walk.com website. Until tomorrow, thanks for listening.